is Ajit Kapoor, head of Asian equity strategy at Deutsche Bank, uh, joins us this morning. Good to have you back on the program. Um, so, Ajit, what do you see in the markets right now, considering the blow up start we've seen in 2012? Well, uh, I'm moderately constructive. We've obviously got up to a very good start. And for the last two years, uh, I was telling our clients that uh, Asian markets and also broader emerging markets are likely to underperform the developed markets mm -hmm. uh, because I thought we were too popular. Our return on equity wasn't that good. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I, I still have that long-term view, which is pretty unpopular. But I think in the near term, uh, Asia became quite unpopular, underperformed the U.S. quite dramatically by the end of last year. And so sentiment towards the U.S. now is, is quite positive, whereas for Asia it wasn't. So I think where our valuations are, uh, where the expectations have gone, I think Asia could continue to outperform as long as the central banks are in an easing mode. Right. Now that's interesting that you expect Asia to continue to outperform, considering that you think that earnings are still overestimated by 10 to 12 percent. Yeah. Well, the earnings are, are coming through for the fourth quarter yeah. in Asia and, and, and the rest of the world, and the Asian numbers are just horrific. Right. Uh, so, but, but, yet but we have gains in the market. Right, so therefore you've got to figure out, you know, what is the market looking at? The market, I think, already knew about these earnings numbers uh, in the third and fourth quarters. And so when they release, the market just is yawning. Uh, and so, so the, the reason the market is going up is, is primarily because the world's biggest central banks have told us that they're going to be as easy as we want them to right. uh, for longer. Right. And, and so as equity guys, as uh, asset class guys, you know, I think that's, uh, that's pretty good but news. But isn't there a risk for policy disappointment? I mean, what, what if China doesn't cut triple R's as much as you expect? Yeah. What if there is no interest rate cut this year? Then mm, what? That's not going to be good news at all. <laughs> and so, so the, what I track for tracking Chinese policy is uh, fine wine prices. You can check that on live-x.com. Yeah. Uh, because Chinese property prices are a monthly data series, and I need more high-frequency data. And so fine wine prices track Chinese property prices and monetary policy very closely. Uh, and so that's an interesting. And, and these prices, if you're a buyer, have been coming down quite dramatically, down about 25% since last summer. I'm just going to repeat what you said, Ajay, because I find that kind of unbelievable. So in order for me to judge what the central bank is going to do, I've got to track the index for fine wine prices. That's exactly uh, right. Yeah. Because what? Because the Chinese are willing to spend when they have more liquidity in their pockets. Well, it's liquidity chasing liquidity, so to speak, right? Uh -huh. So, so. Uh, when there's excess liquidity, uh, it, that generally percolates into the fine wine market. It, it percolates into Macau, Hong Kong property. Uh, but, but the cool thing about the LiveX is that you can track this every day mm -hmm. uh, if you're so interested. Right. Uh, and also, obviously, you've got to track what's happening to these small and mid-cap stocks and property stocks themselves. Right. And, and these haven't been behaving that well. So I think we need a little bit more reflation from China. Are you a wine lover? Uh, I am a wine okay, lover, yes. Okay, now that explains <laughs> it. Uh, so, Ajay, for China this year, okay, so does that mean Hong Kong's going to outperform the rest of the Asia-Pacific? What market's going to do best, I guess? Well, I think the, the H share markets, the Chinese stocks listed in Hong Kong, I think are going to do quite well, as they already are. Um, some of the banks, uh, which we like, uh, we, we thought they got very uh, oversold. Uh, so, so I like that part. I also like Thailand, the Philippines, and parts of Indonesia. Mm -hmm. uh, where we are underweight really is in Taiwan and Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I've just upgraded India a few weeks ago yeah. from an underweight all of last year to a neutral right now. Um, what are you seeing from the, uh, obviously, the European side? That might derail your forecast, couldn't it? It could, of course, yeah, because there's just a lot of balls in the air. Um, and I don't think the Europeans themselves know what's going to happen next. Uh, and so it's always down to the wire. It's always these policy-oriented weekends. But I, I think, you know, obviously, the ECB has done a very good job late last year mm -hmm. with their LTRO, yes. uh, which they'll have another round of uh, late this month. Uh, and so that has cut off what we call the tail risk of bank runs and a liquidity crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously not a complete solution. It's, right. uh, it's just a sort of short-term palliative. Right. Uh, so, so there are longer-term fundamental issues that they need to work through. But I think the good thing is that there, there are going to be no, or we don't think, bank runs and the kind of panic that we were kind of getting into right. late last year. Right. But what about the, the fact that we still have uh, Portugal and some of these yields still pointing to a vested concern about whether or not Portugal is going to uh, need, a, need a bailout soon? Right. Well, our economists think that Portugal is quite different from Greece in terms of their, their political system, in terms of their productivity, right. uh, and, and so we, we don't really put them in the same bucket. Uh, okay. And so we're more concerned about what happens to Greece in the next few weeks. Well, uh, that's interesting because the IMF uh, yesterday came out with a really sh stunning prediction saying that uh, Chinese growth could be halved if we do see a recession on the Europe side. I guess it has to be a severe recession, mm -hmm. but we still have these bond yields trading at such, uh, someone would say, dangerous levels. I mean, 
doesn't that seem to you to be a bit of a risk? It is, but I think we all know about this, okay. and, and so forecasting a European recession is pretty, uh, we all know that's likely to happen, and uh, you talk about Portugal, it's going to have a reasonably serious downturn, right. given how they're well, about Spain and Italy and the rest? Well, it's getting better, and you know, our economists are pretty firm about Italy is quite different, very different from where Greece is, and, and with the new government and the, the technocrats, uh, we think they've taken some very good first few steps uh, in, in really cutting. These guys have been running a primary surplus for many, many years, mm -hmm. and so they can easily repeat that, uh, and that's what's required. So it's going to be hard, um, but it can be done. All right. Okay, so the side show right now in Greece, you, you say they'll get this deal done some way, somehow, before the deadline. Uh, I think so. Yeah. I, I do think so, Okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk about how that affects the Asia-Pacific then, uh, because uh, you're, you're upgrading a lot of uh, stock markets uh, here in the Asia-Pac, India being the latest right. one, right? Yes. It's underweight now. It's overweight. Yeah, right. Well, India's had a very strong run. We, we've been underweight in India really almost for a year and a half, uh, and, and the reason was we, right. we thought that inflation was a problem and the RBI wasn't on top of things. Right. But the good news now is that inflation is beginning to come off a little, uh, and I think people have become very underweight, and stocks are just looking pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so uh, people have been scrambling to cover shorts there, and right. so the market's up about 20 percent year to date. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's more to go there as inflation comes down, right. uh, and the RBI can actually ease policy a little bit. Uh, and the Indian earnings numbers have been surprising quite positively compared to the other countries for right. the fourth quarter. Now, what I find interesting, you're, you're, you're saying underweight Taiwan and Korea, but yeah. aren't these the most cyclically sensitive uh, stock markets out yeah. there? And considering we're expecting basically all ties to lift all boats, I mean, wh why would you be underweight? Well, you've got to underweight something. I, 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 yeah, you can't overweight everything, right. and so you've got to you know, pick. And so, so in Taiwan, the main problem is that you know, obviously the tech sector is very large, uh -huh. uh, and I'm just not a big fan of Asian tech stocks. Uh, there are obviously a few exceptions, uh, like a Samsung Electronics and one or two others. Not but, an HTC today. Uh, but well, you saw <laughs> what happened with the stock. And so it's a very tough environment in tech. And you really need to have massive brand power. And it's a winner-take-all mm -hmm. uh, area. And so the Taiwan tends to suffer from that. Right. Um, and, and I just think that the non-tech part of Taiwan had a pretty good run last year because of Tyler China. Uh, and I'm, I'm not very convinced of the quality of the companies there. I, I, Korea, I like long term a lot, uh, but you've got to underweight something. Right. It's not as cheap as the others. So, unfortunately, it's this year. And I was talking about this policy risk, right? Maybe people and central banks aren't going to ease as much as we expect, and that kind of happened already with the uh, RBA this morning. Uh, yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> What, 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 one quick one, I really can't say much about that, but it's, it's critical for risk assets uh, that the large central banks in the world, mainly the Fed, the ECB, the PBOC, the BOJ, the BOE, continue. What acronyms is that? Uh, yeah, it's not. <laughs> uh, have to continue with an easing posture because it's very clear since 08 when they ease, risk assets go up. When they stop easing, risk assets come right back down. Mm -hmm. And then that forces them to ease yet again. Uh, so the, the patient is um, still not fully recovered. It's going to take years. And so we do need uh, some TLC from the central bank. Well, isn't it as one person said to me, it's like giving a heroin addict more heroin? Um, not really. Uh, but what did I know about that? Um, <laughs> uh, um, so, well, I think we have some long uh, structural problems where we need to work off a lot of debt. Uh, we have obviously a demographic issue in the, the West. Um, and, and also in China uh, going forward. Uh, but at the same time, I, I don't believe in the contractionary expansion. Uh, I know some countries are trying that, so I, you do austerity to grow, yeah. and, and that just is not working yeah, out. Yeah, that's, you know, uh, there's a lack of a plan for growth, particularly in Europe. Where is it going to come from, and especially when you right. have currency, which is stubbornly so high as well? I exactly right, and so it has to be productivity. Uh, and it's easy to say, very difficult to do. Uh, you, you need to get your participation rates up, especially for women, um, and, and just get more productive and have a, a more balanced growth within Europe, where right now Germany is very strong because they restructured then 15 years yeah. ago. Yeah, and, I sure never really got the credit for that, did he? Um, yeah, he didn't, but he really you know, he should. Uh, and, and even you know, just German companies in general. Yeah. Uh, but, but at the same time, there's this huge imbalance with the periphery. And so Germany is really providing vendor financing, which is what China does with the U.S. So, so, the, so, the, so the old U.S.-China imbalance is very similar to what's happening between Northern Europe and yeah. Southern Europe. And so that needs to be fixed. And, and the way to fix that is very painful for the periphery. It's called internal deflation, which means your wages are going to go down 30%. On the banks, how painful a liquidity crunch are we facing this year? 
um, in terms of uh, the European it's banks. Dry up of credit lending, yeah. Well, it, it's European banks, the banks right across the entire system, Asian banks, U.S. banks. Right. Well, it's it's really an issue in Europe, where if you look at the bank credit surveys that come out in Europe, uh, and Deutsche Bank has something called the credit impulse, which is the second derivative of, of loans. And so, in, in Europe, there really is a move towards much tighter credit. Uh, especially in the periphery. I think the U.S. is in slightly better shape when you look at the Federal Reserve Senior Loan Officer Survey. Um, it's, it's getting a little bit tighter on the margin, but from a reasonably easy uh, position. When you, when you hear the IMF saying that the European recession, when it happens, or as it's happening, will cut Chinese growth by half, yeah, I just is saw that. that. Is I, that dramatic or is that a realistic that's a, forecast? Well, what kind of a European recession are they thinking about? Uh, bad one is yeah. Risk, no, um, a depression. When well, does it become a depression? Yeah. Aren't we at a s significant stage of event risk? I mean, Greece is once again at the brink yeah. today. Yeah. But, you uh, know, everybody's really sanguine about this idea now, aren't they? Because they go, okay, well, a deal will be done. We've been here before. It's always done in the last, uh, last minute. So, right. the, you know, everybody's anticipating that's exactly what's going to happen this time. Could there be a surprise? Oh, there, there always could be a surprise. And, and and it is unforecastable, which is why it's a surprise. And so you're absolutely right. Uh, when I look at the near-term sentiment data towards equity markets, uh, this is uh, you know, what individual investors are saying, uh, what smart investors are doing, uh, the put-call ratios. Uh, equity sentiment has gone from absolute panic October 4th to pretty much in euphoria right now. Uh, that doesn't mean horrible things are going to happen. It just means that you are vulnerable to that kind of a negative surprise. How things can change so quickly, I suppose, that, right? Am I seeing that right? The uh, CSI is down two and a fifth percent right now, so it looks like uh, there is some reaction maybe to that IMF. It report. was down before as well. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, yeah I'm, I'm a bit dubious about the four percentage point cut to Chinese growth from 8.2 to 4.2. It's just a, an amazing um, forecast well, to make from the IMF. I think isn't it? The, the math, uh, I need to look at the math carefully because the export to GDP ratio in China is about 35 percent. But they are the ones bailing out Greece right now, IMF, so they must know. What's right, but if you just look at the math, I mean, it really, if, if your export to GDP ratio in China is, I said, 35 percent, and let's say even a third goes to Europe, that's about 10 percent of, of GDP, um, and so you need to essentially say that's going to half to, to get your minus four percentage points. I need Christian Lagarde uh, for this one. I can't. I can't yeah, um, that's a very aggressive enough. recession <laughs> forecast uh, scenario for, for Europe, and I, I, I mean, that's not Deutsche Bank's house view at all. I'm surprised that there seems to be so much patience in the market right now with Greece. Perhaps since we've been here before, we've been to this, uh, this situation so many times in the past. Well, it's, it's a sovereign country, and what is being demanded of it is very hard. It has to be done. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is a prime minister has to explain this to his people, that uh, wages, that there's going to be years of contraction and, and wages going down. Um, it's effectively it's, a depression. That's what uh, uh, Greece is actually signed up to now, in effect. There's an, a, lot of, a lot of choice in the matter, too. Uh, either the other way would be to have a depression outside the Eurozone or within it. That's the choice facing the country. Yes. Um, it, it's years of accumulated loss of competitiveness um, and a artificially low bond yield uh, that has created these imbalances. And so it is going to take years to fix the situation, and it's going to be painful. Uh, we did this in Asia in 97, 98, when, when Asia blew up. Um, and you know, we recovered reasonably quickly because we took a lot of the medicine very quickly. And of course, we devalued our currencies dramatically. A luxury that Greece does not have. Does not have. The concern is the contagion. Spain is next, you know, Italy. This is the problem. They're far bigger than Greece. And again, how can they be contained? Yeah, 650 billion euros worth of sovereign debt has to be serviced in Spain, well, Italy, and France this year. Most of it's front loaded yeah, as well. You can contain Greece, maybe, but you yeah. cannot contain Spain, Italy, Belgium, and Ireland, etc. Well, I, I think Italy and Spain are very different from Greece in that uh, I was telling Grish earlier that uh, Italy has been running primary surpluses through the 90s, uh, so ex interest rates. Of, of pretty large magnitudes, between 4 to 5 percent of GDP. So it can be done again. Um, I think uh, Mr. Monti is doing a very good job. And so it, is, it really, towards late last year, was a confidence problem. It, it wasn't really so much about the fundamentals. So, so that's a point about the patience. I mean, the markets aren't very patient. You mentioned euphoria. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. And the maths, just the bailout concerns, the slowdown of the economy, well, just does not add up, does I it? I think markets are always going to look towards policy makers to do sensible things. <laughs> and that is a uh, 
pretty provocative, aggressive assumption. It is. Uh, it is. I mean, you're actually almost arguing that markets and investors are rational people. Oh, no, we're terribly irrational. Yes. Um, That's better. That, yeah, we, we know that. But, uh, but, but I think there's a, a significant change last year in with the Fed giving the European Central Banks uh, these uh, swap lines. And I think it is very important to get the LTRO in place. That really helped matters because towards the end of last year, there was a, just a serious concern about bank runs and a liquidity crisis there. And that has now been taken off the table. Powerful yeah. stuff. Hey, I'm surprised that John didn't ask about QE3. He has a new obsession this bored. year. <laughs> yeah, he likes to talk about U.S. debt, but this year I guess it's about Europe, European debt. European contagion. All right. Is make no, it's change. far more sexy. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Is it? Is this that, is well, the U.S. That? the U.S. Has yeah. obviously has its share of problems, but I think it, it, the Europe is a bit more immediate. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. We've got an election coming up. No one in Washington wants to talk about debt woes. You won't hear about that until next year. <laughs> so, what do you think? QE3 on the cards, high threshold. What's your thought? Well, I think if we, uh, I think Chairman Bernanke talked about, he's told us that they're not going to raise rates till 2014, one year extra from, from earlier. Um, and I, I think QE3 is only going to occur if you get a, a pretty severe deceleration. It doesn't seem that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. The data is surprising reasonably positively. Okay, there you yeah. go. Ache, thank you for that. Yep. Ache Kapoor of Deutsche Bank.